Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Wonderful to have you all with us. Over the weekend, we all saw Trump delivered strange and egotistical comments at times during his rambling press conference about the death of the leader of the Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, that happened during a raid by U.S. forces. There are many facets to this story, from Trump's ramblings on one end, but also to the use of alliances that Trump has demeaned that killed Baghdadi, to examining just what this might mean for the future of the Islamic State, given its dispersed tentacles around the globe, and what many say with this, what would this portend for the future. And as we discuss all this, it's important to remember that ISIS creation came in the wake of the diminishment of Al-Qaeda and was born of the invasion of Iraq and the destabilization of that entire region. And we are joined today by frequent Real News guest Patrick Coburn, who is the Middle East correspondent for The Independent, and his work over the years uh, has won numerous awards, uh, and his three books on Iraq uh, are fascinating and good reads, uh, and he joins us now, and welcome back, Patrick. Good to have you with us. Thank you. So, no matter what people say, this, this, the killing of Baghdadi obviously was significant, um, but I just want to explore what, what, how significant this is. I mean, you, you know, there's, a, there's been a lot of um, argument right and left uh, in terms of what this really means and how deep it goes. And so what's your overall sense of the significance of this death besides the news-grabbing headlines? I think it's been exaggerated. I remember where he was killed was right up in northwest uh, Syria, where ISIS, Daesh, doesn't have much strength. Uh, he was with his family, he was isolated. He obviously has had no uh, operational control of ISIS for some time, certainly since he moved to this area um, in a house uh, surrounded by uh, um, guys who might be uh, Al-Qaeda sympathizers, but are a different party, uh, and not his own. So I think that that's uh, all been exaggerated. I mean, it is a symbolic uh, defeat of ISIS. After all, he was the caliph. Uh, the caliphate at one time, after 2014, was the size of Great Britain. It stretched right across Iraq from the Iranian border over almost to the Mediterranean had ruled about 10 million people, it had been eliminated, and the al-Baghdadi was kind of a symbol of, of that, and now he's been eliminated. So that's a, a, an important uh, change. But uh, will it put ISIS out of business? Uh, no. In many ways, I, you know, al-Baghdadi was a pretty disastrous leader. He created enemies everywhere. He attacked everybody. So people may say he was in some ways responsible for that big victories. But we don't know how responsible. But he was certainly also responsible for their pretty well inevitable defeat. Let's explore that for a moment. Now, there was an article by Hassan Hassan today I read and some others, <clears throat> some of what um, Juan Cole um, uh, talked a bit about in his piece for the Common Dreams, that actually looked at al-Baghdadi as somebody who was actually effective in terms of pulling uh, the Islamic State back together uh, to create it as a powerful force and creating the caliphate. So in that sense, he was successful, their argument is. And so talk a bit about that and, and, and it, it, where your disagreements might come in and, and, what, and how that led to his demise at the moment. Uh, Al-Baghdadi uh, took over in 2010 right. when his two predecessors were killed in a U.S. airstrike. Um, at that moment, I think al-Qaeda in Iraq was never as weak as people imagined. It still had its strength up in Mosul. I mean, I know guys in Mosul, businessmen who are still paying protection money, you know, 2000s and during that era. Uh, so uh, they still had a grip on the city and the surrounding uh, uh, Sunni Arab areas. So they were never out for the count as much as people imagined. Then he takes over. Um, and what happens next? I don't think it's really his doing, that suddenly there were tremendous opportunities for uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, because uh, we have the Arab Spring uprising in uh, Syria. Syria begins to disintegrate. Uh, the Sunni Arab population is looking for a vehicle to fight the government. Um, the, so the, uh, the ISIS is able, what became ISIS is able to intervene in Syria and they bring experience, they bring weapons, they may bring money, uh, they expand enormously fast. In Iraq at the same time, the government is uh, very sectarian, it's alienated the Sunni population, it's persecuting them, there are lots of protests in the streets, initially peaceful until they get shot, on, shot at. 
the Iraqi army getting more corrupt, uh, it really become a kind of racket. Um, you know, the, all the, uh, the divisional commanders, none of them ever had any exercise or anything like that. So there are lots of opportunities for him. I think that was the big change. Um, it had always, and Al Qaeda had always been sort of pretty tightly controlled. So I think that that's what he was able to take advantage of at that time. So let's take a look. There's a quote that was interesting I found uh, that was in the Daily Beast. Um, and it was written by Spencer Ackerman, and this is the quote. There is no campaign plan, not even a theory, by which the killings of jihadist leaders knit up to a lasting victory. Asking for one would require reckoning with a catastrophic failure represented by a war that only perpetuates itself. That was part of a quote that came from his article today. And if you, if you tack on to that, the idea that the, the origins of, of uh, Islamic State really came out of our, the invasion, U.S. invasion of, of Iraq and what, the, what forces that unleashed. So in, in the context of this quote and that, I mean, how, would, how, how, do, we, how do we make sense of that? Does, is he right in assuming that as well? Well, I'm not uh, entirely clear what, what he means there, but, but I think it, it did come out of 2003, was that shattered the uh, Iraqi state. Uh, suddenly, the, the, you know, you had Abu Musa al-Zarqawi was the uh, founder of al-Qaeda in Iraq in uh, 2004. He was sort of up, actually in Kurdish-controlled territory, uh, uh, close to the Iranian border in the mountains there with so one camp in 2000. Uh, you know, there's this tremendous opportunity that Iraq has disintegrated. And he created this mo movement, which was even more extreme than Osama bin Laden's uh, um, organization. It was particularly anti Shia, it was very sectarian, uh, it was incredibly violent, it depended on suicide bombings used on a mass scale. That was kind of an innovation of his organization, this mass use of suicide bombing, both against uh, civilian targets and military targets. Um, then, of course, uh, Zarqawi gets killed by U.S. Air strike in 2006. Uh, that gets uh, a lot of publicity, but it doesn't, you know, it's not decisive. Again, the, the leaders get killed in 2010, and uh, al-Baghdadi takes over. But, you know, you know, there's a pattern there that knocking off the leaders doesn't make a lot of difference, particularly as it's very much expected by that type of organization that leaders are going to become casualties uh, and they always have another one in waiting. So the idea that you can just sort of decapitate this organization uh, and it's going to fall apart uh, really doesn't work. Um, so I think that uh, there are things that are weakened um, ISIS, uh, the fact it made enemies of everybody, from the Kurds, you know, as opposed by the, by the US, obviously, by the Russians, by the Syrian government, by the armed opposition in Syria, by the, the Kurds, by the Turks. Eventually, everybody was their enemy. Um, that was their, their great weakness, and that's what uh, brought them, them to their present situation. But uh, how far... This will be changed by uh, al-Baghdadi uh, being killed. I think probably less than people imagine. There is a difference, I think, between the attitude of the sort of adherence of uh, ISIS in far-flung countries, you know, in Europe, in uh, North Africa, in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka and so forth, and in their core base in Iraq and Syria. Uh, outside Iraq and Syria, they tend to look to al-Baghdadi as the great caliph, the great leader. Uh, he had a rather less prestige and less presence in Iraq and Syria. Remember, this was a guy who nobody ever saw. He only appeared twice right. physically. Right. And then there are some radio uh, things. And then, you know, they're, they're unimpressive. He doesn't have any new ideas. He doesn't have any particular ideology uh, that he's putting forward. So this is a guy... In in the shadows. Um, so I think that it's all, uh, it's, it has some significance, but it's, it's exaggerated, all the stuff that uh, Trump was producing the other night. So, so speaking of Trump, let's, let's bring it back to the United States for a moment. And, uh, uh, and I, I want to take a look first at this, some of the things that Trump had said at his press conference and then kind of look at the difference between Obama and um, 
Trump when it came to uh, uh, the two assassinations that took place under their, under their presidency. So let's watch this piece from Trump first. I want to thank the nations of Russia, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. And I also want to thank the Syrian Kurds for certain support they were able to give us. Russia treated us great. They opened up. We had to fly over certain Russia areas, Russia-held areas. Russia was great. But uh, the ISIS fighters are hated as much by Russia and some of these other countries as they are by us. Uh, and that's why I say they should start doing a lot of the fighting now, and they'll be able to. I really believe they'll be able to. So what, was your, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on uh, the, the remarks of President Trump last night? We just played a short piece of them. Well, that bit, you know, is, is fairly realistic, uh, to my mind. He, uh, I don't think they told that number of people. You know, uh, he's thanking all these people. They're all saying that they were responsible for this in some way. Uh, that sort of thing don't get told to many people uh, by anybody. And usually down the road, one discovers that what is said at the time is only part of the truth or isn't true at all. You know exactly how they found out that somebody was. And so, um, so I'm not sure I, uh, I find that very uh, convincing. So let's take a look very quickly. This is a, a montage of... Uh, um, Obama talking about the death, the death of Osama, and 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 of course what we just witnessed this weekend with Al Baghdadi and Trump, and just just in terms of looking at the effect and impact of of American policy, the West policy in this entire region, when you look at these two men back to back. He died after running into a dead end tunnel, whimpering and crying and screaming all the way. But the United States has conducted an operation that killed. Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda, and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. The thug who tried so hard to intimidate others spent his last moments in utter fear, in total panic and dread, terrified of the American forces bearing down on him. The images of 9-11 are seared into our national memory. And yet we know that the worst images are those that were unseen to the world. The empty seat at the dinner table, children who were forced to grow up without their mother or their father. Terrorists who oppress and murder innocent people should never sleep soundly. These savage monsters will not escape their fate. He died like a dog. He died like a coward. He was whimpering, screaming, and crying. And frankly, I think it's something that should be brought out so that his followers and all of these young kids that want to leave various countries, including the United States, they should see how he died. He didn't die a hero. He died a coward, crying, whimpering, screaming, and bringing three kids with him to die. So other than just the the clear difference between the, the, the two men as measures of, of being human beings. Um, but the idea of what the United States has done to create this, in a sense, and both are messages. I mean, in tone, they're different, but, but there's a lot of similarity. There are, but there are differences. You know, all this talk about cowardly dogs, you know. This is kind of what you hear in the Middle East from militia commanders, you know. Uh, describing their enemies as cowardly dogs. You know, Saddam and his lieutenants were always describing people as cowards and dogs and whimpering and so forth. Uh, you know, it's... Um, uh, this, is, I assume, is sort of addressed to a domestic audience uh, in the, the Middle East. You know, this will sound very, very sort of, of kind of stuff they're used to hearing from uh, authoritarian leaders or... Uh, uh, as I said, sort of militia leaders in Iraq and Syria. Um, the, um, the, you know, and it's sort of the, the our Baghdad, they were suicide vests, all these guys expecting, didn't expect to survive very long, all this talk about whimpering and crying, you know, more likely to come from these children than our Baghdadi. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, this is, uh, oh, what's the effect of that? In the Middle East, probably not a lot. Um, the 
in a curious way, it kind of elevates El Baghdadi because of he, there he is being sort of denounced in vulgar terms by the U.S. president. Um, but uh, otherwise, probably uh, not a lot. And the question is then, finally, how this will affect, or how should it affect, or how should we reflect on what the future of our policy needs to be there at this moment? Well, I think, you know, the whole idea of decapitating movements because you've knocked off the leader, you know, whether it's Pablo Escobar in Colombia, I was in 1993, you know, uh, this was going to have such a great effect on the c cocaine business in Colombia. What real effect did it have? Pretty well nothing, you know. So, um, you know, governments always like to grand, political leaders like to grandstand if somebody's being, uh, they, some leader is uh, being uh, assassinated, you know, these uh, high value targets. Uh, armies like them, that strategy as well. It seldom works. You know, somebody is uh, killed, somebody else takes over. The person who takes over may be more effective than the person who's just been killed. Um, so I don't think that this has much effect. We'll see what happens, you know, the way Al-Qaeda works is every so often they stage some big event, you know, like the horrible uh, killings in Sri Lanka uh, to show that they're still in business. And in their core countries in Iraq and Syria, actually the situation is more getting more in their favor. It's it's not that they can have a sort of great lift off. I think they're very badly damaged. They have difficulty taking advantage of this. But things are beginning to move in their favor on the ground. And that's what they always predicted would happen and wanted to happen. I don't think the disappearance of al-Baghdadi will really make much difference. Well, Patrick Coburn, it's always a pleasure for us to have a chance to talk with you. Thanks for your writing and thanks for being with us today. We look forward to many more conversations. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I'm Mark Steiner here for the Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. Take care and let us know what you think. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on our videos.